In the last video, I debunked 10 common anti-communist arguments. To keep the trend, now it is time to debunk 10 capitalist myths. As always, this video is meant to encourage intellectual criticism. Without further ado, let's get started. 10. Supply and Demand Most demand is actually artificial. Were people begging for someone to make a toy of a dog that poops plastic crap? Of course not. Ads are an example of how demand is artificial, which is the main way products are introduced to consumers. Basic needs like food, water, and shelter are some of the only ones to have real demand. Ironically, free markets are not even the solution. Industries like agriculture and meat are reliant on government subsidies to stay in the markets. By the logic of capitalism, these crucial commodities aren't enough to sustain farmers and corporations without the government. Nine. Equilibrium. What do Adam Smith, David Ricardo, and Karl Marx all have in common? They all believe that supply and demand isn't a sufficient theory of value. Basic economics says that equilibrium is the state in which market forces are balanced, where current prices stabilize between an even supply and demand. It is true that supply and demand help make observations about the relation of value and price, but supply and demand rarely ever meet. When prices rise above values, investments are attracted, and labor shifts to new sectors. When prices fall below value, labor is withdrawn from that sector. The bourgeois economic theory treats changes in demand as the dominant forces in these fluctuations. But Marxists stress that it is a change in technology caused by competition to produce under the socially necessary labor time. Bourgeoisie economic theory abstracts away from production relations, treating all economic phenomena as a product of individual psychology, focusing on prices instead of value. It is never mentioned that psychological desires are conditioned by their social environment, which conditions us what and how to desire commodities or to attain them through the market. With this, it is hard to even talk of an equilibrium price at any level of relevance. There is no justification to assume that once a price is not at equilibrium, that it will ever converge to equilibrium. Prices only converge upon equilibrium under specific conditions. The approach of mainstream economics is to ignore these fluctuations and to build models which assume that an economy is always in equilibrium. 8. Markets encourage freedom. Many see an abundant market as a concept full of choices where everyone's needs are met, yet, will simultaneously be compelled to feel stuck between competing pressures and in search of meaning. This is because the market is in control of our lives. Don't believe me, just try exiting the market. According to the origin of capitalism, British peasants were deprived of their access to land, which in turn made them dependent on the market to survive. Once propertyless, they were then forced to live in cities and offer their labor time or die. This is the case today where the majority of the working class are deprived of their abundant resources in a world that could cater to all, requiring one to work at the will of an employer who is compelled by profit incentives to give lower wages. 7. Capitalism and democracy work together. The capitalist and the worker are part of two separate social classes under capitalism. Despite blurry lines between small business owners and workers investing in stocks, the distinction is made between those who need to participate in wage labor to survive and those who do not. This also leads to two distinct class interests. The working class desires more wages for more purchasing power. The capitalist is incentivized by profit maximization to get away with as low as wages as possible. Since the capitalist class has the highest power socially, such as property rights, the state is needed to enforce these rights and class interests. It is for this reason that capitalism can only be representative, whether it is an autocracy or oligarchy, state capitalists or free market. These dictatorships, monarchies, and republics are all plutocracies in service of the capitalist class. Take America as an example, where 300 representatives think for 300 million people. Lobbying, electoral colleges, gerrymandering, and faithless electors are all concepts that exist to ensure this representation, preventing a true democracy from existing. When people realize that their petition and protest power is severely severed, agitation is bound to lead to violence. Yet even then the state is bent on maintaining a monopoly on violence. 
which is why armed police are generally the first response to any movement that, by their point of view, gets out of hand. A real democracy would mean that 300 representatives could be recalled by the majority, that is, the 300 million citizens. The lack of democracy is especially true in businesses, where the capitalists and employers make decisions without regard to their workers, and often go against the legality of disabling workers from unionizing to protest the dictatorial decisions of these businesses. If a CEO wants to put thousands out of jobs to simply move to another state or country, they can do that. Neither this, nor any state under capitalism can allow for policy changes against their class interest or any form of true democracy. 6. Capitalism is efficient. When you look at the circulatory system under capitalism, it is very easy to see how inefficient and unstable the system is. All people within the system seek to have more money than they spend, whether it is a savings account or a capitalist accumulating wealth. With this ever-increasing monetary saving, more is exiting circulation. To prevent the flow of money from stopping, more money must be printed to enter circulation. With more money printed, the value decreases. This also means that the value in everyone's saving decreases as well, meaning more money must be saved to keep the same value. Prices will also increase, and wages will go up, but then more people will need to be given more money through these wages, and more people will want to save more to afford the more expensive things. It is a perpetual loop of constant wage slavery and constant capitalist accumulation while the economy gets closer to its collapse. While this definitely shows an inefficiency, it isn't exactly felt as much as this next one. A thorough examination of this isn't even required. Many like to insult communists mocking starvation, famine, and bread lines, but if we assumed poor nations like North Korea, Venezuela, Cuba, and Angola were all communist, that's only roughly 1.27% of the world population, which is predominantly capitalist. Of all these third world nations, People are kept in poverty to be exploited for cheap resources and cheap wages, as well as child laws and legal slavery. This is called imperialism, and it is something that all first world nations are guilty of in order to expand world markets at the expense of other people. We live in a world that is meant to cater to a population of 11 billion people, yet the US alone wastes an entire earth and a half of the world's finite resources. Since just 3% of US military spending could alone end world hunger, it doesn't take a degree in economics to know that this is a very big problem. 5. Capitalism embraces innovation. I've already brought up the following two examples in a last video, so for some, this is going to be a repeat, but I will also introduce a third example. The third example was inspired by a commenter who reminded me of planned obsolescence. Sweatshops are something that has been around since the 1800s and still exist to this day. Sweatshop workers operate in terrible working conditions, often working long hours for low wages. Sweatshops are common in third world capitalist countries exploited by larger and more powerful capitalist nations of the first world. When technology is being made to automate sweatshops and replace sweatshop workers, you would think that the workers would be thankful to not have to work in such terrible conditions anymore. Instead, they are worried that they will become unemployed. Finding other jobs in these countries is not easy, and most of them are equally as horrendous, if not worse. This situation remains this way because third world people are intentionally being kept impoverished and exploited. So then, innovation is being hindered at the will of profit-driven exploiters. But one may think that this example doesn't relate to the first world, and thus is an unfair criticism of capitalism. This leads me to my next example of a first world problem. McDonald's ice cream machines are made by the Taylor Company. The machines constantly break down, and the Taylor Company profits off McDonald's franchise owners, who constantly are required to call technicians under the employment of the Taylor Company by contract and are not allowed to contact anyone else. To counter this, someone invented an app that makes fixing the machine so user-friendly that common employees can do it. Taylor and McDonald's worked together, got this app banned, and reconfigured the machines to not work with this app so that Taylor technicians can continue to be hired to do it. Innovation is being hindered by petty business deals and profit incentives once again, but in the first world. Gradually, the lifespan of bulbs increased. 
The filaments changed from carbon to tungsten, which has a very high melting point, and by the early 1920s, average bulb lifetimes were approaching 2,000 hours, with some lasting 2,500 hours. But this is when lifetimes stopped getting longer and started getting shorter. In Geneva, Switzerland, just before Christmas 1924, there was a secret meeting of top executives from the world's leading light bulb companies. Philips, International General Electric, Tokyo Electric, Osram from Germany, and the UK's Associated Electric, among others. They formed what became known as the Phoebus Cartel, named after Phoebus, the Greek god of light. There, all these companies agreed to work together to help each other by controlling the world's supply of light bulbs. In the early days of the electrical industry, there had been lots of different small light bulb manufacturers, but by now, they had largely been consolidated into these big corporations, each dominant in a particular part of the world. The biggest threat they all faced was from longer lasting light bulbs. For example, in 1923, Osram sold 63 million light bulbs, but the following year, they sold only 28 million. Light bulbs were lasting too long, eating into sales. So all the companies in the cartel agreed to reduce the lifespan of their bulbs to 1,000 hours, cutting the existing average almost in half. 4. Capitalism lifts people out of poverty. When the shackles of the feudalist societal world were made no more by the capitalist revolutions that came, industrialization advanced the world. Many did get out of poverty of feudalist conditions. Now, in our modern times, has this trend continued? Obviously, I'm not talking about the peasantry. There is next to no peasantry to alleviate from poverty. But what about the poor that were created under the conditions of capitalism? In 2015, the World Bank found that the first time ever, less than 10% of the world's population was living in extreme poverty. Between 1990 and today, the number of people living in extreme poverty fell by more than 1 billion. At this point, you might think I'm actually speaking in favor of capitalism, but while this claim about the World Bank is correct, it only sounds nice until you look deeper. These are the type of statistics that neoliberals like to point out and praise the capitalist socioeconomic system, but other statistics not made by a world organization with a profit incentive state that 75% of the world's poorest countries are in Africa, and it is estimated that Africa will be home to 90% of the world's destitute children by 2030. With respect to poverty reduction, the number of Africans living above the $1.25 a day threshold has only been reduced by a meager 8% since 1990. This $1.25 guidepost for poverty was originally instituted by the UN's Millennium Goals to standardize a measure of global poverty, but $1.25 is way below the minimum standard for realistically livable conditions. Instead, we can look to public health researchers like Peter Edward, who adheres to what they call an ethical poverty line, which accounts for a more realistic dollar-a-day threshold. He calculates that in order to achieve a normal life expectancy of just over 70 years, people need roughly 2.7 to 3.9 times the existing poverty line. In the past, that was $5 a day. According to the World Bank's own calculations, that is about $7.40 a day. As it happens, this number is close to the average national poverty line in the global south. So what would happen if we were to measure global poverty at this more accurate level? We would see that about 4.2 billion people live in poverty today. That's more than four times what the World Bank would have us believe, and more than 60% of humanity. The number has risen sharply since 1980, with nearly 1 billion people added to the ranks of the poor over the past 35 years. So why does the UN Sustainable Development Goals set to use the $1.90 line to measure poverty? Because it's the only one that shows any meaningful programs against poverty, lending to a happy justification to the existing economic order. 3. Capitalism is productive. It's completely valid and true to say that capitalism is indeed productive, but not in a way that one might think. In which direction is capitalism productive? for human needs or mere productivity for its own sake. Peter Joseph, author of the New Human Rights Movement, Reinventing the Economy to End Oppression, answers this best, in my opinion, and I quote, The market economy is based on silical consumption, and it really doesn't matter what is being produced, how it is being produced, or why. If demand or production slows, so too does the movement of money, and when this happens, the economy contracts, systematically reducing the standard of living for many. Economically, this means that capitalism is structurally oblivious to humanity's existence on a finite planet. The system wants to produce, not conserve. In fact, if you think about it, 
you will discover an interesting paradox to market logic, the fact that capitalism is a scarcity-based economic system that actually seeks infinite consumption. In other words, it favors the thresholds of goods scarcity to secure competitive profits. Theorized as a model to properly manage scarcity, optimizing resource use and distribution, yet at the same time, the system demands more and more human dissatisfaction and want in order to function and grow and to conserve anything." End of quote. So while it is true that capitalism is productive, it is up to you to decide if this is genuinely a plus. 2. Capitalism embraces individuality. Instead of people being encouraged to follow an entrepreneurial spirit to things that fulfill them, the logic of capitalism incentivizes the capitalist to acquire large portions of mass markets, which requires the production of things en masse, and imposes a double uniformity on society. The working class below is forced to purchase many of the same products and engage in many of the same types of labor. What little individuality that exists in such a system is rather superficial, and, as Guy de Bord, French philosopher and Marxist would call, a society of the spectacle. Many Marxists like de Bord have arguments all around where people say that they are a carpenter or a writer, instead of a person who does carpentry or a person who writes. Actually entertain the differences between a writer and a person who writes. Do we merely have value in the labor we do for a living, or are we more than that? Shouldn't we be people with interests that flourish? This seems like only an ideal or dream, and to many it is. But this is why under capitalism, things like painting, writing, or pottery are only discouraged under capitalism despite being a type of labor, which is often merely considered a hobby if it cannot generate an income. And speaking of artists, many of the greatest art under capitalism has always come from people who are oppressed and alienated. Thanks to capitalism, these arts of the oppressed are homogenized, marketed, and milked for all their value by the capitalists and anyone who can afford them. How can individuality flourish in a system that by nature will alienate the worker from the products they produce and the world they are in. In the Economic and Philosophical Manuscripts of 1844, it says, and I quote, Under the economic system of private ownership, society divides itself into two classes, the property owners and the propertyless workers. In this arrangement, the workers not only suffer impoverishment, but also experience an estrangement or alienation from the world. This estrangement occurs because the worker relates to the product of his work as an object alien and even hostile to himself. The worker puts his life into the object, and his labor is invested in the object. Yet, because the worker does not own the fruits of his labor, which in capitalism are appropriated from him, he becomes more estranged the more he produces. Everything he makes contributes to a world outside of him, to which he does not belong. He shrinks in comparison to this world of objects that he helps create but does not possess. This is just the first type of alienation covered by Karl Marx, but this video is already quite lengthy, so I suggest reading into the other three types yourself. Link to the book in the description. 1. Capitalists earn their wealth. I'm going to give an example and you can decide if this is earning wealth or not. An average of 798,000 employees is working for Amazon. The average yearly salary per employee there is $35,096. Amazon makes $280 billion a year. Each worker generates an average of $351,504 for Amazon. So $316,407 is going to Jeff Bezos instead of the workers per worker, giving him hundreds of billions. This is a prime example of what is called the exploitation of a worker's surplus value. Capitalists privately own property like the means of production in businesses. They take the value that a worker generates and give them a feeble wage in comparison to barely survive. What do CEOs like Jeff Bezos do? He makes decisions for 798,000 people, like layoffs or moving an entire factory. They say how much something costs and they determine where to produce things, such as cheap labor in third world countries. This connects back to the example of how true democracy cannot exist under capitalism. The difference between the capitalist and the worker creates a conflict of interest, and this fact is true for every single capitalist in the world who hires workers. This has been 10 Capitalist Myths Debunked. If you liked this video or learned something new, give it a like. If you didn't, then leave a dislike. Subscribe for more content like this.
If you're interested, don't forget to check out my 10 anti-communist arguments debunked video that was uploaded before this one.